can you all hear me? Is that good enough? Okay, so if you can't uh, yell out. And also, I'm happy to be interrupted along the way. So it's a small enough group and uh, in, spa in an intimate space, so I'd like that. So uh, I'm, I guess the next description today, I'm, I'm, I'm a wannabe historian. And, uh, and you will see that, in fact, um, my name's Bill, and I'm not a hoarder. I'm a collector. <laughs> uh, and honest. Um, and over the years in my practice, when I, and this will be part of what comes out of, it's, I never planned to be a collector. I never planned to be a hoarder. I really never planned to have half my house in a storage locker full of a thousand uh, artifacts. But those are what in design are just called reference objects, that you're always prospecting for things that influence your thinking and help shape your design and how you test ideas. Um, and, and I want to talk about that and what turned into a collection um, unintentionally is now sort of like an albatross around my neck, which I'm trying to curate and give it away as soon as possible so I can have my life back. But, um, but there's a reason here. And so I thought I would do some research uh, and jump on the mission statement of the center here and, and, and try and speak specifically to that. And, and it's about education. That's a key word. Uh, Technology-driven society. That's actually interesting if we, depending how we define the word technology. And if you think of any organized, agreed upon social structure or anything, that is a technology. It's not, just not things and, and objects uh, in, in the formal definition. So that's good. And innovation is the key word here in terms of education. Notice that it appears twice. And innovation appears twice. Uh, it, it, I think I just said that twice. Um, and and, and design, and I want to fit that in, but I want to start on a part that I think is, I feel really strongly about, and, and it's when you come to this notion of innovation and progress and evolution and invention and so on, these are all terms which we use very loosely and it drives me crazy. I really like trying to use language precisely. So by the way, having said that, I've now put a target on my back, and when I use it imprecisely, please throw a dart at that target. But the key thing here says that innovation does not necessarily imply, it, it does not imply progress. I think right off the bat, it is really important to discuss what we're talking about. That um, innovation has a definition, has a meaning. Progress is an ethical decision. And it has associated with it some metric or moral compass of, of good and bad. You're progressing towards something positive or negative. So, so A, you have to have the North Star, and then you have to say, which direction are we going? And you can evolve and you can innovate in any one of those directions. And right off the bat, from the beginning, having some sense is a core to my sense about meaningful innovation and figuring what's the right thing. I, the, the, the thing is, is that we're trained in computer science and we're really, really good at problem solving. We know how to do that. What we're not good at is problem setting. And problem setting is far more important in, in that set. And there's a whole literature on that, and that's not the topic of today, but it lies behind why this slide is here at the beginning. And the second thing I want to say is that whether it's entrepreneurship, innovation, design, they're all team sports. They, they are not... I, I just want to destroy this myth of, I, I purposely didn't dress in black um, to, to show that I'm not a creative, beautiful designer and a genius and you're not. Uh, the, the hubris of design the, and these myths about how these things happen, if we don't understand the process, how can we teach it? And that's the part of the education. We talk, there's people talking about design thinking and, and everybody you ask will give you a different definition. There's these things about innovation. There's all these things about what the process is. And all I can say is that the most important thing, it's not an individual activity. And, and, and I'll, I'll put it this way. I'm Canadian. If you took the top NHL goalies and made a team out of it, the very, very best, the best that have ever lived, you will lose every single game. And yet what we tend to do is hire ourselves. Listen, if you're trying to set up for innovation and you want to be creative, the, the last 
person you should hire is the one you're qualified to hire, and the person you should hire is the one you're least qualified to hire, because a dirty little secret of highly accomplished people is what they've had to neglect in order to become highly accomplished. And the problems of today are deep. They require huge expertise, which precludes being a generalist. And therefore, you have to fill in the gaps. And I hate to bifurcate, but there are people who believe that their genius and their expertise it shines the full 360. Stay away from them. They want to know where I've concentrated and where the shadows are that you cannot see because you're like the proverbial deer in the headlights, blinded by the brilliance, and you can't see there's nothing there behind. But I think I, I can say everything to everybody all the time, and I'm just a genius. And people thrive on that. Get rid of them, no matter how good they are. Don't work with them. Don't, don't work for them. Don't work with them. Don't let them work for you. The key thing is you have to know you have a specialty. Be the best in your group and make sure you complement the other's expertise and realize that together you might have a complete scope. So I'm going to talk about that. And so we've often heard about this notion of T-shaped people. It's a bit of a cliche. And, but I want to dive into this a bit deeper and, and turn the cliche into something that might be a, a, a story you can repeat. The first thing is, is that the width of the T in the bar at the top is the breadth of your knowledge. And, and the, the height of the overall thing is your depth. But the important thing is, is that the top part is literacy. And one of the first things we have to do in terms of respecting each other's specialty and what we bring and don't bring to the equation is understanding the difference between literacy and expertise. And by the way, the thing I've got wrong here is the expertise goes from the top of the charm, but basically it's the sum of what I've got literacy and, and, and expertise there. And so that's got one, but you notice the breadth. There are very few problems in the world, no matter what your specialty is, that that's enough breadth to deal with the problem because you're going to miss something. And you don't want to miss something. And so, so let's just make it a team sport. And so if this is the experience side of things. So that's if, you know, the user interface or the design part. It's not enough. I don't care how great you are. If you, don't, if, you're not a, if you don't have good lawyers, you don't have good accountants, you don't have uh, good engineers, you don't have good salespeople, you don't have good logistics people. But it will just keep it down to three. Business, experience, and technology. And, and, and even these recursively divide down into subspecialties, just as in, in medicine or computer science and so on and so forth. But in technology, for example, security versus networking versus whatever. But what happens is, that when you merge them together, the literacy gives you a common ground. We have shared respect and shared expertise, and you get the combined the broad base, and because of the common ground, you can actually cover that base very well. And actually, we should be able to wrap this around in 3D so that, the, that those dangling tails actually cover in the gaps. And of course, this is an oversimplification. But, but really, what I'm trying to say here is, even in the Renaissance, there was no Renaissance man or woman. And I'll say, I can give you an existence proof. I can give you proof by example. Why did Leonardo and Michelangelo need the Medici if they were Renaissance men? Why couldn't they do their own financing, right? They needed other disciplines to support their activities. Now, they carved up the pie in different ways, and, maybe, and they were brilliant. Obviously, they were extraordinary people. But no matter how extraordinary, they still needed a team. And it was Donatello who played the role of Steve Jobs, who, sorry, it, it was the Medici who played the role of Steve Jobs, whose curatorial thing picked Donatello out of the, the people working in somebody else's studio and said, here's your studio on because you're really talented, just as Steve Jobs did to Johnny Ive. You need all of that. And if you look at Apple, I would argue that, that Steve and Johnny worked better together than either did alone. And that's common in sports, it's common in business, it's common all around. And I'm just trying to say, you need to know who to ask, ask to find out who to ask to find out who to, knows enough to know how to choose who to hire to fill in the gaps because I can't do it. Otherwise, I'm just amplifying my own strengths, but I've already, got, I've already got the best one of me. I'm me. So why would I want another one when I redundancy when I need something else there until I've got the whole 360 covered? Now this brings us here. This is me where you, I'm, I'm going to move so you can't shoot me because I purposely added this because I'm close enough to Menlo Park that um, this is the problem. 
here's something, some guy who's brilliant, absolutely deserves to be famous. But we're setting up children in education about setting these heroes because we have this culture of hero worship, whether it's the Kardashians or Edison. Take your pick. That's, uh, remember, it's all value judgments. Um, <laughs> He didn't invent everything he's accredited with. Nobody could have. If he invented everything he's credited with, what the hell were the people in his lab doing? And if you read even uh, here, you know, with the, um, he, the, he, here's the, what he did that was fantastic. He created what I argued with the first corporate research lab. But I'm not going to say he created the first because I never say this person was first because every time I say that, I find out there was somebody before them. Always. But he did. But he had a, you know, he has a 1,093 patents. I'm sorry, I don't buy that for a second. I believe that there are patents filed in his name, 100,000 with him is that. But even if you, and, and, and to, if you take the international patents, it's even more. Um, if you just take this one patent and you read carefully, um, the, the literature on and what happened and who did inventions and sort of what are the features here? He's the sole inventor listed. No, that's nonsense. The, 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 the core claims are a carbon filament in a vacuum and, the, and, and a breakthrough was that they, they came with, the, with, with some of the treatments here. But Francis Upton and Charles Batchelor absolutely are the ones who made the breakthrough. And, and Edison was working on other projects at that time. They have the diaries. They know what he was doing. He contributed. Of course, he shaped it. But he's the sole person on a patent, which today would cause the patent to be immediately invalidated. Upton was a student here. Really? Well, he, he, because he, he was brought in because he actually had some scientific training, unlike Edison. And, he, and, and, that, and, and, and so this was, this, these are the things that are just really important to, to go deeper and say, what is the story? Do, is it actually true or is it meant as a myth to, to get little kids going? But realize, how do you try to become Edison if you don't actually look at factually how he did it? And what he didn't do is, is as important as what he did do. And, and so, and even then, prior art, for pity's sake, Swan had demonstrated a, a carbon filament in a vacuum tube in 1878. And in fact, that, that there was so much competition because he had a patent in the UK that Edison realized he had it, so they did a merger. But then um, the, the companies that did an acquisition. And, and one of the things that was led very much to Edison's success was he had really good lawyers. And, 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 and so and there's none of this is disparaging. It's just that I don't want some poor kid to try and do something that even Edison couldn't do. And because uh, what's, what's the good in that? And so if you look at technology, I, I, this is great because in 1867, um, the, the, you started, uh, this is only four years after Darwin did the, the origin of the species, already the, the metaphor of evolution was starting to be used to describe the evolution of technology. And it's really interesting, and, and Marx himself was sort of saying, that, and I love this, that the critical history of technology would show how little any of the inventions of the 18th century are the work of a single individual. And I think the data absolutely supports that statement, no matter what else you think about Marx. Uh, but I, I love doing this. And, and we come back here to go back to John of Salisbury, uh, the Bishop of Chartres, who 11, you know, he, in, the, in the 1100s, um, wrote this uh, 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 thing about the Bernard de Chartres, that, that this is whole thing about standing on the shoulders of giants. For trying to set aspirations here, it's that don't try to be the inventor. Try to make a difference. And then one of the best ways to do that is to know whose shoulders you should target to stand on. That defines your principles. It defines your values, who you choose to uh, stand on. And then if you're successful, be happy and really, really satisfied if you've become worthy enough to have someone else stand on your shoulders. But to be the first, if you say that, not only is there hubris, but the fact is, is that there's a very good chance you're going to be proven wrong. And that feels really bad to be called out, not knowing the, the, the literature on your own field. And, and there, there's actually, so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of this other than there is an emphasis in the popular culture of, of the genius inventor versus the stand on the shoulders. And I just think it has to be balanced. And both, there's parts there that are, are important because 
just like Jobs, he doesn't the designer, but a lot of stuff wouldn't have happened without him. He was critical. He was the quarterback, whatever you want to call it. That's all good. And, and so the thing is, is that I liken the, the genius designer, the genius inventor, to alchemy. It's a myth. A lot of neat things were discovered in alchemy, but gold wasn't one of them. And, and so it's far nicer and it's far more useful in anything to think about mining as the metaphor as opposed to alchemy. Uh, and so the al alchemist delusion is that you can make gold. But no, the first step is prospecting. And that implies you have the right tools, you have the right training, so you can actually go out. And so when I'm carrying a canoe over the Canadian Shield, getting eaten by mosquitoes and just swearing like because it's raining and I'm miserable, that I'm walking over a diamond mine or a gold mine because I don't know anything about geology and I don't have a Geiger counter even if I was looking for uranium, that if you have those skills, it's a whole other experience. How do you equip yourself? What are the right tools? What are the right skills to go prospecting? Where do you look? Who do you look with? How do you do that? But even once you've done that, you still have to go through the logistics of how do you mine the stuff that you found? And it doesn't matter whether it's an idea or anything, the mining is a critical thing that follows the prospecting. And you might go back and realize it's not there. But that's not even enough. You still have to refine. And, 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 and get it there. And, 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 and then you have this whole thing of goldsmithing so that you can really make it worth more than its weight in gold. And that's, that's the beauty. In some sense, that's where the design and a lot of things we, we have comes into it. And this cycle has got far more uh, to do with it so that you really do have something that you, that's just precious. And I haven't even spoken about marketing and financing and legal and uh, ecological impact, gold especially. How do you deal with all of those things? And for everything I described, if you take it literally in terms of gold, there is a, a, a parallel in, in every form of research and, 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 and entrepreneurship and innovation. It's, uh, it's the real deal. This isn't art college, kids. This is, this is design, right? You, there's no muse. You're not allowed to have a muse. You have to deliver. And, and so... Uh, you, you wake up, you hate your job, you hate your client, you hate the work, your bank's about to be for, you're being going to be foreclosed, um, your kids hate you, your wife's about to leave you, you still have to go to work and perform like a professional. Or you're not a professional. You can't wait for the muse. And, and that's the thing about how do you go through this stuff and just do what needs to be done because it's a really hard thing to do. And it takes serious commitment. So if you're not having fun, don't do it. You have to be a masochist in some sense to, because, because, because it's, it, you know, it's no pain, no gain. And the key thing is, take a, lettuce, a lesson from Marcel Duchamp in the arts. Turn, make it into an art, this notion of creating something out of found objects. Because nearly all new innovations are subsystems that have already existed. You've seen if you transform them in some way in terms of size or cost or speed, and you put them together in different combinations, you come up with something different. My friend Marilyn here is a, a fantastic cook, but that's the whole thing. You can break it into sub-modules, you make different combinations, you can come up with a completely different recipe and do things differently. Um, the, the worst is that you can either make paste or you can make bread uh, out of exactly the same ingredients. Uh, and, and it's better. And so it comes down here to uh, Proust, and, and this is this notion that the only true voyage of discoveries isn't to go to new places and make new things, but to see what's already hidden in plain sight right in front of you. That's one of the most important skills that, that we can start to say. And so in one sense, what I'm trying to do today is say, what does he history teach me in terms of how you can have a career? I'm 70 and you can keep on going and with the same refresh and skill seeing new things, some of which I just saw for the first time today because of some of the comments that came up in the conversations, that that actually helped me see the world in a different way. That, that, and, and the act of creativity is the act of making the obvious obvious before it's obvious. That comes as a consequence of just seeing things differently. It's this surprising obviousness is an, a radical evolution that comes as a result is what's much more interesting than this the incremental uh, pr progressive in, uh, iterative uh, type of in innovation. And so line on this, you have to start saying, okay, that's enough arm waving. What, how, do you, how do you actually just think about this in, simple, in reasonably simple terms? I'll just say, I, I'll practice what I preach. I just saw the long tail, Chris Anderson's book, and I sort of said, because it, it, it's just like, 
again, people who know me know I, I make really bad puns, and I just can't help myself with every time somebody says something, I'm turning it over in my mind this whole time to think I'm not paying attention, but no, I'm just trying to make a joke out of it, or I'm trying to go, but the point is, I, everything I see, everything I read, that's what you do. You turn it over, and in this case, it says, hell, if there's a long nose, why isn't there a, sorry, if there's a long tail, see, I Freudian a slip. If there's a long tail, why isn't there a long nose? And, and then I think about, okay, what do I know about long noses? Well, I know about Pinocchio. No, I don't want to be a liar, but I think of Cyrano de Bergerac. Okay, that's great. I want to be a lover. So let's have something we can love. And this is some data from the uh, National uh, Academy Press, but there's a whole series, about four volume bo books, which you can, you can get if you just go to the National Academy's Press and look for information, information technology. But if you look at this, this basically so shows the, the key is here, that the thin horizontal black lines are academic research, the thick red ones are corporate research, and the thick black ones are productization. And this shows how this combinatorics, and I'm sort of things coming together in synthesis, is that the top one is the internet, the next one are local area networks, and the bottom one is the World Wide Web, which are very distinct things. People often call the internet and the web, the, in, in, use those terms interchangeably, they're radically different things. One is the platform for the other. And, and so you see how there's these interchanges between uh, academia, industry, products, and research, and, and how the things move down across and they, they start to combine and you get these different things. Now, these types of diagrams exist in biotech, they exist in telecommunications, and they exist in terms of information technologies. And, and it's really interesting because they give you a temporal visualization of, of data-based uh, histories of, of, of one take and one representation of how these technologies work. Yes? Why is there a gap in World Wide Web? Uh, why is there a gap in World Wide Web? What, what's the moment? What happened at the beginning and at the end of the stuff? This, is, this would be um, earlier work in hypertext. I would, uh, Ted Nelson's work, for example, but before it had got generalized. And there's, if you've met Ted, you'll understand there's a, <laughs> there's a gap somewhere in terms of the, uh, the, 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 this here in sort of Xanadu and so on and so on. And so it started to pick up because hypertext, if you talk to Andy Van Dam, who's from Brown University and so on and so forth, they were, he worked with, uh, on some of the early hypertext. So there was hypertext. It just hadn't been able to hit the... Uh, go mainstream and, and take off because when we're talking about innovation, we're not talking about the academic papers at this point. Um, we're, uh, we're we're trying to get get out there, and uh, so even though that is the academic, it, it, there was a cooling down period, and I I didn't make I and that's the best. Ex I hadn't asked that question of myself, so thank you for pointing something out that I hadn't even looked at my own in the data I'm presenting. Uh, but that's that's uh, that's my immediate response, which I think is a reasonable one, if not correct, and. Uh, and so let's come back to this thing called the long nose when I talked about the, 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 the long tail. This is the graphic on the cover of Chris Anderson's book. I flipped it around. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what it basically says is that there's a 20-year period from the inception of the first idea to the point it becomes a billion-dollar industry. So maturity, I'm going to say it's a billion-dollar industry. And most of it is this uh, really down low, and all of a sudden it spikes up in the typical hockey uh, uh, stick uh, uh, shape. Most of it is below the radar. And when I say it's below the radar, it's sitting there for anybody to look down, see it, and pick it up. But most people don't even look, much less uh, um, know how to look and actually start playing with what, um, what you might do with things. But because the, they're not prospecting. Right? And, and so here's the example. In 1984, my group in Toronto, we were doing uh, some stuff around capacitive multi-touch. We built, and then in 85, we published a paper. Um, it, this is a, 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 one of the other lessons that comes out of this particular example is that we were making a drum. I was making a drum to drive my digital synthesizer for a percussionist. If you know who Steve Reich is, uh, the musician, minimalist uh, sort of uh, pattern music and stuff. Uh, one of the guys in his ensemble, uh, Russell Hartenberger, I did a piece for him. He knows nothing about computers, but he's a really spectacular percussionist, and he wanted to do a hand drum so he could drag his hands. That's why it was built, and it had a pedal, like a nerdy ball, a guitar pedal, volume pedal, to, hooked up to the computer to work like a timpani pedal, and so he could actually play this piece that I did for him. That's why, that's all we were trying to do, and we were too uneducated to be stupid. Uh, we didn't realize that this was interesting, other than just making an instrument. So, lesson here. 
some of the most influential innovations are the unintended consequences of doing something different, which is why tightly managed research at the basic research level is not a good thing. And if you look at any longitudinal studies about that, you'll show that the more the corporations try to manage the research towards uh, predictable goals, productivity goes down. And that's been done over Fortune you know, 500 companies. And, and so I'm, I'm just saying that because they ignore this unintended consequences. And, and, and then again, challenge everything I'm saying. Don't take, just say, here's my opinion, here's what I'm saying, and push back because by that, that's how we learn. And, and I'd far rather be wrong and learn something because you called me out on it than, than be right. But the key thing is over in 2007, you had something called the iPhone came out with capacitive multi-touch. And all of a sudden it broke through the surface of the above the radar and took off. But in the meantime, there were in fact three companies that I can identify uh, that I know of that were already commercializing capacitive multi-touch. And the, furthermore, Bell Labs had done a much better job than us, earlier than us, but when I gave the paper in 85 at Sinkai, Lloyd Nakatani, who worked at Bell Labs, came up in Murray Hill, came up to me and sort of said, Bill, I think you should come down and visit us. And he introduced me to a guy named Bob Boyce, who had done so much better than us. He just sort of said, hell, it's a waste of our time. You're so much smarter than us. We, but we're really, he had no applications. We had the applications. He had no, uh, he had the hardware. Why wouldn't he do it? And we never, ever, ever, because here's the legal part that held that back and why nobody knows about Bell Labs. Bell Labs would never release it. We went back again with Mark Weiser several years later because we made these huge things at Xerox Park, and they were perfect for editing the documents after you'd scanned them before you went off and made on these you know, huge uh, document processors. They wouldn't do it because they didn't know what they had, so they were afraid to license it at too low, and therefore they got nothing. And there's these types of things which you just, uh, you know, just put up your hands and say, what can you do? But, but I want to just show that these things this whole long nose goes beyond, uh, goes around all kinds of everyday things. And so here's the roller skates from when I was a kid that I grew up with. You strap them on your shoes and away you go. Now there were ice skates called bob skates that did the same thing. Well, we'll stick with, uh, with roller skates for a minute. And so these evolved into something like this. And this is if you think about uh, car hops at, at, at drive-in restaurants coming out to you with your milkshakes uh, in the, in what, what's the, the, the uh, California car movie, whatever, but anyhow, but, the, but if it's just the cliche of the, the 60s, 50s and 60s was with these things and people dancing, uh, going along the, in, in, on Venice Beach and so on. They're still there. And, and, uh, and, and then the innovation was you do inline skates. And you can see the derivation of this. On the one hand, it's from roller skates. It's got, it's got four wheels, but they're in line this time. Um, but actually the boot and so on is looking more like ice skates. And so it's a hybrid of the, the you can actually draw the genesis of your world. I'm just going to stick in the roller skate part, but you, you know you could fill in the gaps and get that and say, wow, this is, pretty, this is a pretty neat innovation. This completely ra changed the whole thing about uh, roller skates and so on and so forth. And so this is the most innovative, right? Well, actually, no, this is. This is patented in Netherlands in 1819. And, and it's an inline skate. And so there's a number of things about this that are, and this is the stuff that if you can search these things out, even if it has no engineering perspective, and you're a teacher and you're trying to bring kids along, it's just bring these examples because they're so charming, they're so funny that you actually, they will repeat these things. Remember that Stephen will tell you, my friend, that good stories were the original form of viral marketing. And our job as researchers and teachers is to market ideas. And if we can not want to own our stories and say, hey, that's my story. No, no, here's your story. And then you can turn it into your own because you, have, you bring your own examples, do the same thing. Then you can, that's how culturally we change the culture so that we can innovate. And we reward that. And we make sure we have, we have show and tell, keep what you used to have in kindergarten. This is my show and tell. I love this. And here's the part. Here's what makes this really, turns it from an interesting story to something that's just fascinating. What the hell were they skating on in 1819? <laughs> right? Did anybody think about that? Where would they do that? Down the hall of Versailles? I, I, it's just like, it's just, it's, it's fascinating. And, and, and so it's, it's, those are the things that are amazing. But that's, that tells you a really important lesson, that even from this example, there's something really important to take away. It doesn't matter even if you had have made the modern rollerblade in 1819, if you didn't have pavement on which to skate, 
you couldn't use it and you need this infrastructure and you always need a perfect wave of things and for example that's why the mouse took 30 years from 1965 to Windows 95 before everybody had a mouse and by the way patents only last 20 years which is why when Marilyn and I were at U of T if you were in our group if you try to patent any of our research in the group you were kicked out of the group because the cost in Canada for one patent, let's say it costs $20,000 to get a patent. I, in, in Canada, you could hire in, 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 the, in the 80s, uh, you, could, you could hire, you could pay a graduate student, uh, it's cost for a graduate student for a year on that. What do I want, a graduate student or a patent that's going to expire before it ever gets into practice? There's no question about that. And that's why everything we ever do, because it doesn't come from a single funding source, it goes straight in the public domain, because paid for by, we can't identify who paid for it anyhow. But when you're looking at these things in the long nose, you can actually go back to data. You can do things other than the playful things I'm doing. And I don't expect you to read these curves. I just want to say this is just a bunch of data that tells you about networks and speeds and so on and so forth. But, but this one, for example, is just showing what was going on with the Internet. And, and we get here, 1995, all of a sudden just goes spikes up like that. Well, what the hell happened there? Well, that is where Mosaic came out. And, and, uh, and HTML had been developed, and that's, that's when the... That's when the World Wide Web took off. And there's other things here that show how the number of web servers, the bandwidth, all these things went. Every single one of these is a trend which has a trajectory. Put it this way. You have a new idea. You say, I've got this great idea. This is going to happen in the future. Just, and, you, and you have no history behind it. If I drew a sinusoid here, and then I stopped here because it's now. And I do a straight line below it. And I draw, I, I do a sawtooth and a square wave. And I said, continue those lines. You can continue any one of those. If I just drew a point on now and say, extrapolate from that point, what's the answer? The only answer I can think of is yes. There's no right answer. How can you extrapolate from a point? Trying to plan the future without knowing the past is like trying to extrapolate from a point. You may not, if you follow those other curves where I give you the history of these trajectories, you may, it may, the future may not continue. There's discontinuities and other things. But for pity's sakes, it'll get you in the neighborhood. And then you can start to do the risk analysis that things might change. This is a simple technique. It's easy. I, I, I can take five-year-olds and they will get that. And, and they will extrapolate well, graphically, depending on, on, the, on the regularity of the lines I'm drawing. But how we think about it, we have to internalize that and say, what does that mean in terms of how I do my research and how I, uh, how I work? And the other thing is, is that understand that all of those trends are continuous, gradual change that you do not notice. Okay, how many people here are parents? O okay, how many people here have parents? Do your parents or your children look a day older when they wake up in the morning than went to bed at night? No. How many people measured their kids, or you were measured, on your birthday to check your height on, on, on the counter? I, in my family, absolutely. And the reason is because as a society, we discovered we don't notice our kids growing up and, that, and these change because we don't notice small, continuous, gradual change. So we take a me we've taken a mechanism to do a check. Just like you check your fan, the, the filters in your furnace every year. Or you clean your chimney, whatever. But we don't do that in our science. We don't do that on all these trends. We don't have a round robin where we're monitoring, hey, look, at, uh, let's see, bandwidth is uh, going up, the price is going down. Uh, it's, and it's going faster than the, the, the improvement of the cost of memory. That says to me, cloud computing. Right? You know. And, and, and if you go back historically, you'll see this. We have this oscillation because these, these parameters change relative to each other from the graphs like I showed you before. If you're not monitoring them, you don't, you don't notice the day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year change, but you realize that, oh, my God, there's a trajectory here. And that's why we go from, we've gone sort of from time sharing back to personal computing, back to time sharing, uh, which we call cloud computing now. But it's the same, it's the same kind of thing. And, and we, can, we, can, we can do this. So I want to give you some examples about how some real things that are actually kind of fun. And we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about portable music players. To, and here's the start. 
Okay, so this is the Marine Band uh, 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 harmonica. It's got 20 reeds. It's, uh, it, it's the, this is the most famous uh, one. It's not the first. They go way back before. I could have picked any number of instruments. I did this one just because we all have probably tried to play one. And the, but it was 1896 is when this first came out. The, the one I have is in the collection. Is, is Everything now is in my collection, it, and I'll tell you if it's not. But the... Um, it's a portable musical instrument. It's handheld. It makes music. It's, it's portable. And so uh, you take it on canoe trips. You take it hiking. And, uh, but what about one where you can listen to speaker earbuds as you move around? Okay. So, oh, a radio. So this is uh, the, the, the Regency TR1 transistor radio from 1954. It's the world's uh, commercially first uh, commercially available transistor radio. It's the second product ever made with the transistors. As designed by painter Teague and Peter Phil, and just to confuse you further, Teague has no relationship to Walter Darwin Teague, or his, there's a whole other industrial designer from Chicago who uh, is named Teague, who has no relation, which is actually pretty funny, given how few industrial designers there were in the 1950s. But the thing here is this radio changed everything. The only, and it was largely happened because they needed a killer app to market the transistors. Because after Bell Labs, down the road from here, did the tra first transistor, Shockey and the gang, and, and, they, and by the way, there's a history long nose to that as well, if you want to explore it. But they need a product. So the first product was a hearing aid. Now the problem is that's not a mass, that's not going to be the killer application because it doesn't have the economies of scale that radios do. So that, they, they were subsidized uh, by TI, uh, and, and the, the, who were making the transistors, and that's where that radio came from. Designed in Chicago, made in the Midwest, and it, uh, we'll come back to that about how cool it is and why it's so important. But you also have to say, well, where was the music? Well, the music was coming from records. Well, where were the, how did they get to the radio? They came through, you needed uh, the FM or AM radio st uh, um, thing, and, how, and, and you also needed the transistor. So there's technologies of, and also places, where does the music live, what form, how did it get there? So it's a wireless streaming device, if you go to one level abstraction, we had streaming audio back then that was portable with you all the time, and it was free, the cost of, of the transmission, especially if it was FM because they didn't know how to monetize it yet. But, but there you have it. Well, what about a music player in which you can store your own music instead of just relying upon the streaming? Uh, well, guess what? Uh, the cassette was made, and Sony made the, the Sony Walkman. And this changed everything. This is 1979. And this is a really big deal. Sony was completely unknown. In fact, Sony didn't, wasn't Sony at that time. Sony had a completely different company name. And Sony was the brand of, of, the, of, the, of the cassette devices, not the company. But because this was such a huge success, they took the name, this, this Sony name overshadowed. And so it became the name of the company. Now, it's important to know that. Because it says that you need to be this flexible, adaptable to changes and, ch and be willing to change your identity and what you are and how you perceive yourself. We're going to see another example of that as we go along. But that, that's important to know. But the other part about is um, what about a, a, a music player that uses random access digital MP3 files rather than analog sequential audio cassettes? Because you, you have to fast forward through all the music to get to where you want. Whereas in records, you could just jump from track to track. Why can't I do that? Well. This is the world's first, to the best of my knowledge, uh, a a commercially available uh, MP3 player, portable MP3, battery powered, you can carry around, uses headphones, and it's from March 1998. And, and it, the music started in flash memory, and Max has 32 or 64 megabytes. Can you imagine that? That's, that's, that's unbelievable. 64 megabytes. No, no. When you saw that, you thought you died and gone to heaven. And, and, and it could hold eight, count them, eight four-minute songs. And that's with compression. And, and the problem here is it took, it took solid-state memory, but you had random access to those eight songs. <laughs> and, and you needed the compression. So these dependent technologies that were there, that you package these things together, and you come in, and usually the people come in too early. OK. so. What if uh, we took that and just because we get sick of the eight songs, I want to have a radio built in too. So yes, yeah, so now you have this, mer this you know, hybridization of these two different things. And so these are the uh, iJam uh, J100s. By the way, if anybody has a red one or the uh, blue one, you ever, if you see 
any of these colored ones anywhere. I don't care how much they cost. Call me and tell me, and I'll send you the money. Okay? I, they're really hard to find, at the, but I want the full set. And one of the reasons why, and we won't get into it today, is because there's two things about these that are really interesting, which we don't have time to go into detail. But I would say, first of all, they were ripping off the, eye, the, the Bondi Blue iMac by having the semi-translucent. They took that from the, 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 the iMac that had just been released when Steve Jobs took over after the, the second coming of, of Steve Jobs. But this um, prospecting and, shall we say, and mining and, and riffing off as opposed to ripping off, um, the multicolors and the small things Guess where you saw that later on was with the iPod uh, Mini. That was the first, up until then, iPods had all been white or black. So there's this playing around the industry of each are uh, riffing off of each other, just like rock and roll bands will take a good riff from each other uh, if they can do it without getting sued. Um, but what if you made one that had a microphone because you can record audio? Why can't I use it also for uh, that? Well, of course, we had that, and that was a sensory science. And so, again, it's, still, it, it's only got 32, it's the same old thing, 32, 64 megabits of memory, but at least you could record your voice, which is much, you can compress that way more, so you get way more voice, so you could actually tape lectures and stuff like that, um, and, and away you go. And that's 1999. So we're moving along here. But what about getting all the cable hassles out of your face so you don't have to plug in with all these adapters and so on to get the music from your PC into your MP3 player. Um, this is 1999, and, this, and, here's, and, and again, we don't have time to go into it, but here, um, this is the Creative Labs Nomad. This is June 1999, and you could do that. <laughs> it's still $250 for, for uh, 16 songs. <laughs> and, and, but, but at least it had a docking station, so you just put it in and bang, it would load. But guess what? Where did that come from? That came from the Palm Pilot. The most important thing about the Palm Pilot was hot sync. You drop it in one button push and you could synchronize with whatever. It was agnostic to whatever calendar program you're using, whatever do list you're using, and all that came. And that is the reason and not the reason that the books tell you why it was successful. Hot sync was the thing that differentiated the Palm Pilot. Not that it was small, not that it was easy to use, not that it limited functionality. I have several thing, PDAs in my, in my collection that would sh that, that show that other people had all that. Hot sync. And it was the interface of things working together seamlessly. So when you bought it, you didn't have to hand push every single thing into the thing. And, and by the way, because it only took one minute, um, you would keep it synchronized. And so if you lost it, you're at the depreciated cost of a $200 device and your company paid for it any but how, so who cares? So what about one that stores MP3 on a miniature hard drive, thereby increasing the amount of music you can store? Finally, you can get beyond eight, eight songs. And, and this is it, the Hango personal jukebox from 2000. And it is actually really cool. This is really rare. If you ever see one of these, it's a bargain, buy it. And you can sell it on eBay and, and for probably $2,000. But the, um, which is one of the few pieces of technology that's worth more now than it was when it came out. <laughs> um, although it wasn't cheap when it came out. It was $7.99. Um, but, it had uh, 4.8 gigabytes. So we're up to 1,000 songs right there. This is a major breakthrough. So you sort of say, well, this is pretty neat. And this is a, a, along the ways. But this is, to the best of my knowledge, the first commercially available. It was sold under different names as well. But, but uh, it was a Korean company. And, and um, it's really neat. Uh, uh, Ray Ozzy uh, knew I was looking for this. And he actually gave this to me, which I uh, thank him forever. Um, but what you needed was you needed a miniature hard drive. Now, what's fascinating here is that this is a hard drive from IBM that actually, they were already making miniature hard drives, not quite as miniature as was in there by 1954. That's where that, that hard drive comes from. But, so why didn't we have hard drives sooner? Well, the fact is, is that as anybody of a certain age here knows, that the tolerances between the head record heads that pull the data off of the disks, then the disks are wearing at some ridiculous speeds, I mean, it's just a hair's uh, distance apart. And so if there's any bumping, that head is going to scrape the hell out of the surface, and you've just destroyed the whole thing. But as we got to laptops, and you wanted to bring up the memory in laptops, they, they took something from space craft and missiles, like namely uh, what we call today an IMU, but basically this cluster of, of uh, three-dimensional accelerometer, gyro, and um, and, 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 and compass, magnometer. And they put them together and they put them into solid state. So all of a sudden they cost almost nothing. And so they went into 
the hard drive, and so the minute your, your, your thing started to move or jiggle, it would uh, pull back the heads, because it could move that fast, and get them out of the way so that you didn't tear the heads apart. And you needed that so that it didn't wreck it. And, and so it's, 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 it's kind of cool that you could, you could do that, but it was a, what was happening in the, and it was Apple who first put them into the, the laptops, but that is actually what enabled this stuff to start to happen. And, 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 drove, and help drive the prices down and make this stuff available. So there's this ecosystem. People saw the opportunities, saw the timing. Okay, I can't do it here, but oh, okay, we can get this. I can just take it off of the laptops, put it here. It's a whole different thing. Bam, we've got this. And they did it before Apple did. And, and that's the IMU uh, chips there. So what about one that uh, it integrates the MP3 player with the other portable devices, which I already have with me? Well, that's kind of interesting. I already have a smartphone. Why do I need to carry around an MP3 player? And this is a foreshadowing, which actually finally happened historically in the mainstream, but this is the first one to do it. So this is a Siemens phone from 2001. Remember, the iPhone didn't come out to 2007. And, and you, it had voice recording, memo function, but it also had uh, an MP3 player, so you could listen to music w w and with the same headset that you're listening to the phone. Uh, in fact, the, the Europeans were, at that, in this sort of period, were further ahead. They had, uh, the United States was sort of a third, not, not third world, but they were... Um, the, the, they were behind in terms of the, the Europe at, at the time, partially because the tariffing structures were different, so they went digital faster, and, and bec because then they didn't have to pay for, it, it's a longer story, but there's historical reasons. Do you want to understand that in terms of the ecosystem? The, qu the quick summary about that, though, is just to say, why is it that nearly all the internet service providers, like AOL and so on, um, Earthlink, are North American? Because in Europe, they had exactly the same telephones, exactly the same switches, Everything was the same, and the reason is here for $25 a month, you could have unlimited use of your phone. You could be on it all day and not have to pay a cent more, and you could get an extra phone for $25 in your house so you could dedicate it to your computer. Whereas in Europe, it took something like six months to a year to get a phone, and once you got it, you paid long-distance charges even for a local call. And even if it was just next door, you, you paid per time, per distance, and so the further you were going, um, the, the more you pay, and the clock is ticking all the time, and therefore you did not set up. And so the only way when I lived in the Europe, working for Xerox, and you were dialing in, you called the company, and then they, it was all set up, so the company called you back, so they had a bulk rate on the phones, and so they paid the phone bills. Nobody home commuted from Europe until the tariffing charges were there. And it has nothing to do with the technology. It's what the, in the jurisdiction, how are things charged? Why are so, things so much better in the States than they are in Canada in terms of cell phones? Cause, because we have the most expensive cell phones. And the idea that you move from New York to Los Angeles and don't change your phone number because you've got a, a flat rate, unlimited data, and phone calls throughout North America, it doesn't exist in other jurisdictions. And therefore, if you, that's, if you only live in the States and you make your decisions based on everybody's like you, you are going to get a really, really big surprise. It's really important to understand this stuff. So this brings us to the iPod Classic in 2001. came out October 2001, and then there's a second generation here, the third generation here, and the fourth generation there. And that's really interesting. Um, and we'll come back to this because they don't look the same. They're all white, they all have the same curves, they have the same proportions, the depth changes. But the um, thing I want to say here is that first of all, it took three and three quarter years and four generations for the iPods to become an overnight success. And I'm not being facetious here. It is really important to understand. I met Steve Jobs for the first time because I was hired as a consultant to go when the Macintosh first came out because the Macintosh, like the iPod, like the iPhone, were all commercial failures. Despite all the hype and the press, that's marketing. That's salesmanship, and Jobs was really good at it. They were all failures for at least a year or two. And it wasn't until the laser printer uh, and the Apple Talk and that came out with the SE and that, that, the, that the desktop publishing took the Macintosh out of the doldrums. It took three and a half years before the iPod really took off. And the iPhone was an, a disaster, and we'll talk about that as well. So here's just to give a sense here, and why you have to start thinking, take into account the finances, and what, what are the impacts here. This is the share price of Apple, and this is when the, uh, the first generation one, generation two, 
P, that they added PC support. Now, this is really important. What else is going on that you didn't predict? Napster, which was uh, basically this where the file sharing, so you could get music for free and all that sort of stuff, they finally got put off, pulled off the thing. That was, that was like a gift to Apple because they had the mechanism to thing, and so that opened the opportunity so that they then opened up the Apple Music Store. The, how could you possibly do this um, be, if you didn't, uh, if this was still competing? You can't compete with free. And, and, and the other part is, I, I want you to think about this for a minute. The music industry hated Steve Jobs. They thought he was this jerk who didn't know anything. He was just trying to take over and, and, and get into their business because he's into media and stuff like that. And the lawyers are as important in the success of the iPod as, 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 uh, as, as Johnny Ive who did the, in, and his team who did that or the engineers who did the engineering or that because they actually managed to convince the music companies to sell them any song, including the whole symphony, is, that's what they call the song, for 99 cents. You could and do that because they said, these guys don't know what they're doing, they're probably going to broke, but we might as well take the extra revenue. They did not realize they were just killing, shooting themselves in the foot, the head, and the arms, and the chest at the same time. Because they didn't understand, they didn't know, they didn't trust, but they thought they were smarter than Steve. And I'm not saying that Steve understood how big the iPod was going to be. He did not. He hoped, but he did not count on it, and his business model did not assume that he was going to make those revenues. But he was happy to take them when they came. And he was prepared to be able to expand and turn it up to 11 when necessary. The advertising, forget it. They're the ones who own the, the, the advantage here. That the, if you had a, an Xbox with recognizing Bill Gates in silhouette holding an Xbox on those colors, what are you going to sell? You're going to sell iPods. Those things are so iconic, and there were companies that copied that graphical style, and all they were doing was helping Apple. They never complained at all, because they knew you see the colors from a distance, you just know that that's what, the, what you're selling. And so we come along, and we come along, and we, and like this, and, and finally, Christmas 04 was, was iPod Christmas, when you had to have one. And the great thing was, everybody went and got them because they were afraid they wouldn't be able to get one. Um, because it was now on the PC as well as the Mac, the music store, and the everything. And, and of course, nobody didn't get one. They created a pet rock or a, a Cabbage Patch doll frenzy intentionally through clever marketing and made sure that their supply chain could meet the demand, no matter how fast it grew. But they didn't overstock. But they had that all figured out. And, and you can see the volumes and the, and the price points here. And then you do this other stuff. Those, these ads, these aren't ads, but these are worth a fortune. That, that, and they come for free by just getting on the cover of, of Business Week or Newsweek. And, and this thing, genius. The thing that sold more iPods was the white earphones. Everything else was black. It doesn't matter. You'd never see the MP3 player because somebody's going to steal it from you at the, in the early days. But, but you know what kind of um, MP3 player uh, Lance Armstrong is using. It's got white earphones. People would get their old cheapo things and buy white headphones and use them and hide the iPod so everybody would think they had an iPod and be cool. Because it, it, it's easy to be cool. It's, it's because if you can hide that stuff, it's all about image. It's, it's not even about audio. And the, but the other observation here is, is that in every generation, they change the, the most iconic part, the, 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 the dial wheel here. And, and the observation three is that it was a bad idea from the day one. Because sequential access is not a very good, sequential search, if you're a computer scientist, you know this is not a good way to go. And that dial is sequential search. And it worked great when you had no music. And your first five albums, it was great. And as you added more. But remember what I said about change blindness. It never got bad in a discontinuous way. And so you, fi it, you, you finally got, it got worse and worse and worse. But at a certain point, that you, you, stopped, you, you had enough music because you, you stopped going to the end of the list. They, there were some other shortcuts they'd used to try and innovations there. But it was a dead end thing from the beginning, knowably so. And so you know that's not going to last. And yet, um, here's the thing on the business side. This is the Apple iMac G5. It came out in 2004. Look at the design language. That is iPod. That says iPod. It's the white. It's got the same corners. It's got the whole same shape. That looks like a big iPod. But Look what it said here. Um, 
from the creators of the iPod, the new iMac G5. Is that not the most incredible thing of chutzpah you've ever seen in advertising? This is my mentor in, in advertising. And if this is, the minute I saw that poster, I, had, I got one, I tore one down, I kept it. Because I knew that was important. I knew they were going to change the name of the company. Because they pivoted just like I spoke about earlier and just redefined what they were. They're a consumer electronics company now. Their competition is Sony, not computer companies. And, 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 and that actually happened. And then we come into the iPhone. This is the G1 2007. So this is really interesting because um, now you don't even need, because memory has gotten, solid state memory has gotten cheap enough because of Moore's Law and the sort of thing that happens. And so now you can get all the music you need on here. And furthermore, you can interact and find the songs because now you can have browsers and so on and so forth for the music. So you've rendered uh, the, the scroll wheel obsolete except for niche markets like when you're running you want these little tiny things that you can strap on your arm when you're jogging. But the more important thing is the iPhone was not successful. Steve Jobs believed that, it, that the phone was the killer app and he, like Apple's whole thing, has always been a closed system. I don't want anybody else there. The money's ours. And they were, his staff were fighting with him and finally, after a year, when they were losing, they've lost enough money, he finally relented, and reluctantly so, and said, okay, because he thought the, the killer app was the phone. How wrong he was. The phone is an afterthought now. And, and, and so they built the app store. And so what happened here? The, okay, the iPhone was released in 2007. It wasn't a commercial success. It took till July 2008 before the, uh, I, the app store came out. And, and then these guys did the o uh, Ocarina. How many people have an Ocarina? That was one of the first apps that came out. Um, it, 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 it turns it into this flute. Uh, and you can still download it. It's still current and so on and so forth. They, they sold over a million copies in the first six months. And it's still, it made it number one in the app store at the beginning. And it's still in the top 20 apps ever in the app store. And the cool thing about it was it wasn't that you could play this little mocarina and play yourself and just amuse yourself. But furthermore, you could play concerts. They had it hooked up with a social network. These are all a bunch of Stanford, the three um, people who worked through the music program at Stanford, which is one of the top the computer music programs. And, and so you could actually play ensembles and, ha and have the, all this social stuff, just like in the people cyclists do today when they can compete with each other. You could have orchestras all over the world and play together with, with this thing. And it, it, it just, that changed everything. Then it became profitable. It's not about the phone, it's about the apps and the infrastructure. And, and, and so now you understand why I'm justified in coming back because basically we've got this little windblown thing you have in your pockets. You can play music as you walk around, just like a mouth organ. So we've, it's a, the, see, I'm a musician. A B, it's an ABA uh, classical ternary form structure that I just gave you in sonata allegro form. So, so, um, but it, if we come back to uh, some things, we could talk about uh, streaming. Is at Park in 1993, I actually think I, this might have been the first, and I'm very just going to say that, and I was in the room, it had nothing to do with me, but we were working with some stuff called multicasting in Mark Weiser's lab. And, and so we arranged to send some interns from uh, RPI, Rensselaer in, 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 in Rochester, and we, we hooked up and started to have a, used it for voice. That, was, that might have been the first voice over IP uh, conversation. Later on, they, they actually had a band come in and play across, and that was the first music uh, streaming music thing. And we're half, after about two hours, we're just yakking about absolutely nothing with these kids over there. And, and, and Mark and uh, Roy Want and a bunch of us were all there. And, and, and then somebody at the far end said, we better hang up. This is getting really expensive. And then someone else said, you just don't get it, do you? <laughs> and they didn't because, that, that, that ch because you realize you could stream and it just didn't matter at, at that point. And, but so, but that was the long nose of what became in about 2008. But, but it's important that 2007 and 2008 is when the, the, the heavy players just landed in terms of uh, uh, music streaming.
that, that brought us this whole thing, which actually is kind of interesting. So you've got Spotify, Deezer, and SoundCloud, all that started right in that period when the iPhone first came out. But I want to say, and this is where I want to sort of, I'm winding down now, is sort of saying here in 1907, we, we have this guy, uh, Thaddeus Cahill, and he had this thing called the Telharmonium. And he really did have that, all that machinery. It weighed 20, um, 20 tons sitting in the basement of this building in New York City in Manhattan. And he, was, and he had a subscription model, so you would subscribe to his streaming music service. This is before Muzak or any of these things, where the, the, you could pipe music through the telephone. You'd pick up your phone, they had ways to power it, so you could actually make it, use your turn, your, juice enough power with a booster to, you could hear it through a speaker. And we'll come back and back to the music players. And of course, the music players disappeared. It's now embedded in the earphones themselves and the whole MP3 players there. And uh, your butt is. And so, and yet, the, I'll come back to where we started. Evolution is a scientific concept and progress is, a, a, is an issue of ethics. And, and we, and so we have this power. We have this history that can help teach us how to be more effective if we know how to use it like any other tool. And one of my heroes here is a guy named Melvin Kranzberg, who's a historian of technology, and he has seven laws. If you look up Kranzberg's law, if you can't find them, email me, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you. But this first law is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. It will be some combination. I think I said that at the beginning. I reemphasize it here because he's that important to me. His second law, by the way, is a lovely play on words. Invention is the mother of necessity. You invent something, you put it in, um, you're going to get stuff wrong. You own it. You made it. You broke it. You fix it. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But again, there's, this, it's, there's a responsibility there that comes with it. The things we make, the things we design, the things we build are cultural artifacts which are having as much or more impact on our society and are going to increasingly have so than music, cinema, art, dance, and all the other cultural so art uh, disciplines put together. That doesn't take anything away from them, but it adds a huge weight of responsibility to our shoulders. And you just look at the last election and, you'll, and what's going on in Brexit, you look at these things and say our industry has a lot to answer for. Because none of us consider those issues. What's the good, the bad, what's the compass, how do we do this? And so this leads us to a question as to what do we do next? And I'd say this, when those of us of a certain age were going, the question, the miracle was, will this thing work? We were making uh, text editors that crashed every five minutes. You knew you were going to lose your work, and so you would save every 10 or 15 seconds. That's how we worked when you're writing programs or things like that. And we thought we'd died and gone to heaven because we weren't punching cards. And we could do it interactively. Those days are gone. You don't win design awards if your bridge falls down. You don't win design awards if your editor crashes all the time. It should just work and work seamlessly. And we can do it now. And with the powers that are coming out now with ML and all these types of things. So the question now is not, what can I do? The question now becomes, now that I can do anything, now that we collectively can do pretty much anything that we can imagine, what should we do? And in some sense, I haven't emphasized that part. It's been a sub-theme. But I've given you some of the techniques to know how to do it so you can spend more time thinking about what to do. And with that, thank you. And if you have time for questions, I'm glad to go for it. Yeah. Uh, really, wonderful, really remarkable. I appreciate it so much. I'm really sure technology is really great to see. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Just amazing. I have this question. Um, you would go and you would really uh, have so many insights on how the uh, software was actually driving the success of the hardware. Fantastic. But let's take it up to the present. So, um, you know, people have been criticizing Apple, for example, for uh, not really moving forward on its hardware uh, products. Uh, and, for example, the keyboard on the, on the MacBook Pro. So forth, raising prices, and, and, and you know, there, there hasn't been that big a change since the, the, uh, the, the late of the, the last big one for the iPhone. So my question is this: um, Is do you think that this cycle of, of creativity is going to continue, and that there's going to be some uh, big new category coming up that will follow the 
look at the scenarios that you, that you had before, or do you, do you think that there's something really different now that it's all going to be in the cloud, it's all going to be services, uh, the, the great age of uh, new products is really, is really old? So I definitely have an opinion, which may be right or may be wrong, but it, it's at least founded on some experience. So first of all, um, I'm really glad you're here. And, and if you could somehow write to me, I, I, I don't know very many historians of technology, and so I'd love to have a, a pen pal and stuff to throw ideas back and also see what you've been doing so I can learn from that. So it's a good question. It's a, it's a, it, it actually is a question. So I'll, I'll put it to you this way, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to, to blow smoke. It's because it really is true. It's it, I, um, I want to get this finished, and I, I need help um, and advice. So the um, the first thing is the most important thing that we could do. I, I'll, I'll put it this way, and this is what I said to my management: we have to we can ask the right questions, critical thinking. So. I reject the term Internet of Things until you can show me the Internet of unthings. Because there's never been anything but a thing attached to the Internet. So let's get rid of jargon that is not constructive. There's, there's something going on there. I know they're describing something, but that label is not a good label. Ben Snyderman did a great job when he, just, when he didn't have anything to do with the invention or of, of direct manipulation, but he labeled it and gave it a, a categorization which was meaningful and better than sort of stuff that, uh, that we did in the, human, the, the Norman and Draper book uh, that Jim Hall and, and Don did. So labeling is really important. It's a critical part of, of taxonomies and so on and so forth. What are the attributes? Now give me that. That's clear thinking. The second thing is we don't need more crap that doesn't work and doesn't work together. And so let's say where are the problems and where does the complexity lie? And what we've missed is we have gotten really good since the iPhone that set new standards that we've reduced the complexity of any single gadget application, you know, device or service. And that's wonderful. And we've pushed the price down. But all that's done is we've got more and more stuff out there that's simple, wonderful, desirable, addictive, and easy, you know, and, and affordable. And what we miss is that the cumulative complexity of a bunch of simple, delightful, affordable things is way beyond the human threshold to deal with. So we've just transferred the problem where the cognitive load is as opposed, and where the value is. We've lowered the value and increased the load as opposed to fixing. We fixed here, we just moved it over there. So here's my answer to your question. We back to look at things with different optics. The next big thing that everybody's looking for even framing it, what is the next big thing, already shows you're asking the wrong question. Because the next big thing is not a thing. It's not an application. It's not a device. It's not a service. There will still be devices, applications, and services. But the next big thing isn't a thing. It's a change in the social relationship amongst the things that already exist and are going to exist. And when I say social relationship, I mean it in the sense of sociology. Uh, things like kinship, proximity, uh, what's the moral order of place, how, how do I know the place and what the behavior should adapt, and so on and so forth. All the things that people do, and then how do you fit that society of technologies, the technologies meaning devices, applications, and services, together and merge it with a, a society of people. Now, if you can start to think about those social relationships, I'll give you one quick example. When I rent a Ford Escape, I own a Ford Escape, I have an iPhone, when I put it in there, I've introduced them, as opposed to pair them, I introduce them you're mine, you're mine, you guys, you have a nice trusting relationship because we're all the same, we're all in the same family now, okay? So I rent a Ford Escape at Whistler, exact same car model. It is not enough to pair because the geniuses who thought this stuff up are thinking engineering, how do I connect this device to that device, as opposed to realizing there's a completely different level of kinship with a rental car than there is with other. But the constraints on the ubiety, the, 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 the things of, of place, in a rental car says, I cannot drive a car without having a hands-free and eyes-free operation. So I need the, to have some pairing and stuff going on. But damn it, I don't want a single thing of mine going into that car and anything from that car going into my phone because it's a completely different kinship. 
And because nobody even thinks in sociological terms, it's broken and I rent cars and I bet you everybody here who rents cars on a regular basis has found somebody else's data in the car and they had no idea. And I blame our industry because we're thinking about the technology and engineering and we're not thinking at all about um, these other things of usage and what's appropriate in terms of moral order of place. And there is a term called ubiety, which I believe that Mark Weiser used the wrong word when he said ubiquity, which means everything everywhere all the time. Ubiety means the right thing at the right place at the right time with the right behavior at the right price. And as soon as we start thinking about ubiquitous computing as opposed to ubiquitous computing, which is what Mark meant all along, um, we will go someplace. And just even change of language like that helps us do that. And so now I would frame it this way. When I say here the, the provocation, what should we do? Four things. Things should just work. Things should just work seamlessly. Think, sorry, things should just work. Things should work together. They should work together seamlessly. And in working together, there should be a cumulative reduction. Every time I add a new thing, it should reduce the complexity of operating everything else I have in my ecosystem and increase the value, and they it. And if you did those four things and set that as the lodestar that you're shooting for, I cannot think of a single thing that could have more impact because it's not about, it's not about the gadgets. It's about the social. And, and, this, and, this, and, and the funny thing is, when we think about the society of technologies, when we talk about social computing, it has nothing to do with the society of computers. It's, it's computers poorly supporting the society of people. But the first thing to do it properly is to get the society of computers so that they actually know who's prox and they have proxemics and all these other things. A lot of AI and what we're trying to do there and ambient intelligence and so on relates to this, but the language does not lead you there. And changing the language so we can lead there will change the behaviors and where we spend our time and research. It is a fool's game to try and make a new gadget, a new service, or a new application relative to what impact we could have if we thought about the overall architecture of what is, do we believe about society and how do we make things service as opposed to get in our way and frustrate us. Because if we do not fix this, we're going to be buried by complexity and we're going at 120 miles an hour down the freeway and there's a, there's a, a bird flying straight to the windshield and, the fa and we're going the faster we go and the better we get at making simple uh, frivolous things, the more that's going to splatter. And, and that's, I, but I have no strong feelings in the matter. <laughs> but that was a really good question. Thanks. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, I, I just want to make a comment about your last comment. Yes. I don't think you know you said uh, it's what can it's not what can I do, but it's uh, what should we do. Yes. I do think uh, we've gone well past what should we do. It's more how should we do it. AI robotics, mass surveillance. You know, every we hear new technology that scares everybody. So it's really, you know, how do we implement it? How do we make sure it's ethical, etc. But my question, though, is, uh, is um, I actually just figured out to the end of your presentation what you meant by the long nose. Yeah. And so I, 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 and I want, to, so I want to ask you because, uh, so the real question is, okay, did, was there a product that Steve Jobs was working on? that at some point it was like, this is not going to work. And I'm asking that question because it seems like the long noise is about stick to it, you know, stick to it till you get it. But, you know, when does that become fatal? No, uh, so there are, um, there's a couple of books on Apple design you can buy if you can find them in the library. Uh, um, but I can just tell you the same thing at Microsoft. Um, we kill products that we've invested uh, very large amounts of money in that look, they're right about the ship and then they get pulled. You don't see the things that Apple doesn't ship. There are models, they, but they've gone through. If you look at their prototypes, and the, there's ideas all the time. You have to know when to bail. And you, but, you, but the process is how do you make that decision? And so all, all I can say is that the, the one guy I can say is this is an axiom. I say this all the time. I think it's probably on my website as a mantra. Everything is best for something and worst for something else. And the difference between a wise person and a fool is the criteria they use to decide the, and how well they know the, the, the who, what, when, why of what, it, what is best and what it's worst for. And so you, and when I have meetings and we're discussing these things, you are not allowed, and this is part of design thinking, it's the most fundamental thing, you must have multiple ideas. And for every idea, you are not allowed to advocate for the adoption or the rejection of anything. 
but you are allowed to comment on its attributes, positive and negative, in an enumeration without prejudice. And when you've gone through that and you have at least three, but you should have five and ideally seven different things that you're considering, then you can start to weigh the relative merits. And the biggest mistake we made is we commit to ideas right away because we're always behind schedule and we run. The whole reason I wrote a book on sketching is to say, how can I afford to explore seven projects instead of one for a fraction of the price? So that when I finally make my decision, and that's part of the problem setting side, I can do that. The, if you're not throwing stuff away, um, listen, design is the most negative thing in the world. Everybody says, it's all creative, it's all this stuff. No, no, no. 99.9% .9 of ideas get tossed. And most of them are going to be yours or mine. And that's why we get good products. And if you have your first idea and you go and run it and start a company, you're probably going to lose a bunch of money, a lot of investors money, and you're going to get a really valuable education, but I'm not sure you want to pay the tuition fee. Right? Okay, I think we should start. Uh, one more? Uh, one more? Yeah. Hey, Mr. Buxton. Uh, I'm Raymond. I'm a local high school sophomore. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and uh, see, all us here, yeah. see all of us here. I mean, your talk was very inspiring. It really changed the way that I thought about innovation and everything. And you know, especially as um, I co-founded my own company, so I'm constantly looking for. Uh, I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> Not how to be that precocious. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, to go. sorry about that. Yeah, but um, I'm constantly looking for new ways to innovate. Yeah. And I was just wondering uh, about your take on 5G and Apple's uh, recently uh, uh, regression from the from that uh, area of innovation. I was just wondering, like, um, what is your take about the future of 5G, especially for um, areas that are, don't usually get the benefits of it, such as you know, predominantly uh, highly rural areas of the United States? Yeah, so I, it's an interesting question. So I'm not going to say too much on, on, on the answer, A, because of time, and B, um, it, I have to know what I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. I drive across the United States. I had to do it both ways, twice, uh, back and forth every year. I try to drive from, the, from Toronto to the West Coast and back. Uh, simply, it's like I read Travels with Charlie in Search of America, uh, John Steinbeck's book, and I just uh, I want to relive that, just, and, and just to, to, to get a feel for the country, and it changes things. I think that uh, the last time I did it, I, my estimate is that 60-70% uh, of the continental U.S. Has, does not have data coverage. And so those of us who live in the, in the bubble of uh, Silicon Valley or Route 128 or, or around Redmond, uh, where you get unlimited data all the time everywhere, uh, that's just a delusion. Now that'll change. But also, you forget when you go to other countries where you can't go in there. So this whole notion of uh, accessibility and equ equity and, and so on and so forth and, and uh, uh, the, the, the two worlds, the, the technological gap within the country, much less with, at, around the world, is, is, is of real concern. So the concerns there, I, I, I'm not going to talk, even if I had uh, knew I, to have the time to go through it. But, the, but I would look and say, if you believe what I said about should work together, should work, work together, work seamlessly and with reduction of complexity, um, I'm far more concerned about how things can in fact work and I'm, I, I, I don't, I do, I, there are several things that need really high bandwidth and low latency, which uh, you cannot afford to go to the cloud even if it's really close by. And so no matter how fast your network is, you can't change the laws of physics. And so you have to figure out um, where are these uh, temporal peer-to-peer. -peer. I would like it so that when I walk, here's the definition. If I talk about mobile, uh, in, in mo mobile computing um, uh, through my mobile phone, pretend this is my mobile phone, this is not mobile. This is just a handset. My activity is mobile. And since everything we do is a compound task and I'm working through the ecosystem, this is where you buy it and that goes, I should be able to continue my task. I do not want it so that if I've got this intelligent agent and I've got the most perfect AI in the world in my smart speaker in my house, and when I walk out the door scrambling, picking my briefcase and stuff like that and trying to get out and it's raining an umbrella and holding the kids and grandchildren, um, and the conversation's over the minute I, I walk out the door. What the hell's with that? That's not ubiquity, that's not ubiquity, that's not service, that's not continuity, that's not flow. And when I get into my, and I get to the car, it should change again because it's a different place. And when I, get, and I park the car and I run into this building, I'm trying to find the office where I'm meeting is. I've never been here before. And I'm trying to get there. I want the sound directions to take me there. And then at the same time, I want to be able to say who is in the meeting, what are we talking about? Who, what's their background? Have I met them before? I want to be able to do all that stuff. And I walk up to the whiteboard, I want to be able to say, hey, Cortana or, or Siri or whoever it is, um, put my talk here. And by the way, move this over here. Can I see the graph of this and sort of in this area there? 
And there's not, and even though Richard Bolt showed that stuff in 1978 uh, and put that there, if you go, please go to the YouTube, look up Richard Bolt, put that there, and realize that nobody in the industry right now can let, understand a dictic gesture, directional gesture, to indicate the, an in, uh, 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 a, a pronoun by, uh, to, for the speech. Nobody understands, hey, what's this? Put this there. What's around here? No speech system out there right now with all the AI because it's not my job. Because the people working in speech are brilliant linguists who don't understand interaction. And, they, and how to integrate that stuff into the thing. That's what I mean about things working together. And by the way, the minute I move away from that display, I want the behaviors to change in exactly the same way your mobile phone, when you walk in the middle of a conversation, you park your car and you're using the hands-free, when you park the car, turn off, pick up the handset, you just had 100% change in interaction language. You had a 90% change in local technology manage that call. Because of that, you have 100% continuity of conversation. And damn it, it's about the conversation. It's not about the interaction modality. And what's right here is wrong there. If you are using speech to give me a secret, a, a private message when you're landing a sentence at the airport, you should lose your job because somebody from Apple is sitting behind you and I work for Microsoft. If you're not using speech when you're driving your car, you should lose your driver's license. And it doesn't matter how good the AI is. It doesn't matter how good the speech recognition. It doesn't matter how good or bad the idea. Place dictates how the behavior should be. That's what moral error order is all about. And the systems have to adapt to the moral order. And so consistency comes with consistent with expectations in, in place and content. And not about it, it works uniformly everywhere. It should work uniformly well everywhere, uniformly appropriately everywhere, but it, that means it has to adapt its behavior to the context. And we do not do that well, and that's not part of the front or end of the AI agenda right now. And that's not a slag off on AI, they're working on really hard problems, but if, you, if I was a graduate student, these are where I think we need to spend time. And, 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 and historically, I think I just gave you examples about how Everything I just said about going in the future, I was referring back to things that every one of us have already experienced and could have drawn on to help inform our decisions of where we go. And so I just tried by example to show you how I, I work on that. And that's what the talk was about. Okay, I think we have to stop. We can go back and talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>